What's up, guys? This is Coach Donnie with ElevateYourself.org. Welcome to another episode of Volleyball Anatomy, where we talk about training and coaching education to help you take your game to the next level. In this episode, we'll be doing a Q&A session with Jake Gottesman, who is a sports nutritionist with a master's degree in exercise and nutrition science and works with amateur, collegiate, and professional athletes that are strength and power oriented. So volleyball players, basketball players, lifters, MMA fighters, you name it. Uh, we actually had him on our last episode where we talked about how to structure a nutrition plan and understand your nutrition for volleyball athletes specifically. So make sure you watch that episode first, which I'll link below, uh, because there's gonna be a lot of information that we're not gonna cover here that is already covered in that episode. So uh, Jake, glad to have you back on the show. Uh, just so the fans get to know you even better, uh, why did you choose to become a sports nutritionist? Absolutely, and uh, ha happy to be back on, on the second episode. So um, it wasn't the way I most people plan, but I guess no one plans with, uh, with that idea in mind of, of what they're gonna become and then actually become that. Yeah. So I mean, my bachelor's is actually in psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my undergrad degree. And I realized I needed to get into to fitness. So I looked up every program and I found that University of Tampa was one of the few programs that did both exercise and nutrition. Um, and so long story short, I started working for overtime athletes as an assistant coach, but I, I specialized in nutrition with, with that master's degree. Um, and Chris, who's, who's the head coach at overtime athletes, he was doing all the strength training. Um, and I realized there was a little bit uh, missing with, with some of the athletes. They didn't have a nutritionist. So I kind of volunteered to be the nutritionist for those guys. And uh, I was lucky enough to do such a good job with the guys that I was uh, promoted to director of nutrition. And I realized I needed to learn as much as I can because these are high level athletes in my hands. And I need to make sure that, that they're performing every day of the week and especially on important game days. Yeah. So, so working there inspired you to, to get your master's degree in nutrition or did you already have that before working? So I actually was attending uh, university of Tampa for the master's degree and I saw they were taking interns at the gym and I needed an internship to graduate. So I grabbed that internship and um, I was hired on as one of the coaches full time. And so when I graduated with my master's degree, I already had a full time job there as a coach. So it was a very smooth and I'm very lucky and, very grateful. Yeah, that's awesome. And for those of you who want to get involved in the, the fitness industry and sports performance, a lot of people have to start with that, that free work, that internship. I don't know if your internship was paid or not, but that, that grind free. and that hustle. Yeah, there you go. Free for three months. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it just makes you value it a little bit more, but you got to get that foot in the door and that's how you can make your living. Cause once people know your name and know, you know, your stuff, and they could trust you. The referral system is infinite, and people, and then you don't have to work at. So well, you got to work hard, but not in the same way of just trying to get your clients. So, hundred percent. Great story. Hundred percent. All right, now it's time for the Q and A. So, we'll, like I said, uh, we'll be taking questions from YouTube and Instagram. And if you did list a question that doesn't get answered, it's probably because it was already answered in the last video. Uh, or we just didn't have time to cover it. So we might have to come back for episode three if you guys want more of this, uh, but this is just a great opportunity for us to, to learn a lot from Jake here. First question is from John Q. I've heard different approaches to meal prep for athletes. Um, should you do multiple small meals consisting of snacking versus two large meals in a day, especially for a college student living alone with significant money barriers and time, time I guess times restrictions? I don't know if that makes sense. Sure. I think I get what he's asking. Um, and so this is one going to depend on how you are as an athlete. And what I mean by that is, you know, body composition. So my, you know, a bodybuilder, for example, is going to be way, he needs to be way more detailed with his nutrition than maybe someone who just started lifting or just started playing sports. So a pro at his top level is going to need to be way more detailed than someone who just started off. So that's one thing to, to keep in mind, but I'm a big proponent of multiple meals uh, throughout the day. The reason being is there's been multiple studies that have shown that you know, one meal of hundred grams of protein does not equate 
to the same bang for your buck as four meals at 25 grams of protein each. The reason being every time you, you take in protein, there's a spike in muscle protein synthesis. You're able to, to gain you know, more muscle and in some cases even burn fat simultaneously. So I'm a big proponent of having three to four meals a day plus a shake. You get more spikes throughout the day. Um, that being said, if you can only manage three meals and no protein shake, that should be good for, for most people. But as we get to a higher level, we need to have a little bit more meals and we just need to be more detail oriented with, with everything around us, whether it's training, recovery, or nutrition. Yeah. And I'll add on to that. Uh, protein supplements is a super cheap alternative to a tight budget. I mean, a, you eat like a, a four ounce steak, you eat 35, 40 grams of protein, that's expensive. That could get eight to $10 on sale if you want a decent steak versus a scoop, two scoops of whey protein. It's gonna be less than a dollar. So, you know, protein supplementation is, is huge for that. All right, next question. Chris Solis, to get more in shape, I hear some say it's good to watch what you eat while others say exercising is better. I have a feeling it might be a mix of both. What's the actual best way of getting in shape? I guess he's asking for the, what's the ratio between you know, the balance between exercise and nutrition. Sure. Uh, and, and so the one people always say things like, you know, um, abs are made in the kitchen and, and nutrition is almost more important than, than training. Um, but training really is that fire and, and nutrition is, is, you know, the gasoline you can throw on that fire. Right. Mm -hmm. So training is what starts everything and nutrition is what optimizes it. So if you're looking to gain muscle and you just are, you know, you're eating high protein and, and you're in a caloric surplus, but you're not working out, it, the muscles don't really have a reason to grow, right? So the training is really what sparks everything. If you're trying to lose weight, you can obviously lose fat and, and you know, in a caloric deficit without exercise, but that potentially is also going to take off muscle with you. And I don't think I know anyone who wants to lose muscle and, and not fat. Uh, so you have to make sure your training is on point, right? Have, um, have a, a great training routine, and then you can use that nutrition to optimize it, right? So, so make sure the training, everything is good. You know you have a good program. And then the nutrition plan is, is obviously highlighting that strength training program as well. Yeah. And there, there's no easy, easy route to, you know, sports performance, at least at a high level. I think people want to oversimplify and say, well, if I just train and not worry about it, eat, I'd be good. Or if I just eat and not worry about training, you got to do both. And you got to do both seriously if you want to be a competitive athlete. All right, Michelle Manley asks, what is the optimal amount of protein to eat after a practice or workout? And how much water should I drink before exercise? So protein post-workout, I'll make it real simple. So, I mean, we don't have one unified answer on how much protein you need. Um, if you're a smaller individual, 20 to 25 grams of protein post-workout is going to be fine. Uh, and if you're a larger individual, then, then about 40 grams can be fine. And like I said, there's no one universal number. There's no scientific answer for you need 35 grams of protein. It depends on, you know, how your training session was. Was it difficult? Did you train multiple body parts? Was it a skill session? When was your last meal? So, so really the short answer is between 20 and 40 grams and, and you should be fine. 24 less of a training session, smaller athlete, 40 grams for, for more of an intense training session and a larger athlete. Awesome. K13 asks, is there a difference with protein intake before or after workout? How, do, how does other nutritional details like iron and carbohydrates play in muscle development? Sure. So, um, so different nutrients in regards to muscle development. Uh, the big thing is that nutrients and minerals and all of that this is what's going to make you healthy and feel good all the time so if you're neglecting this you're just not going to have the the same energy levels that you would normally have um, throughout you know any training session or skill session um, and then remind me what was the first part of that question that he asked is there, is there a difference between protein intake before or after workout sure um, so this is kind of goes into the, uh, the anabolic window, right? It's, I need to get protein as soon as I can right after my, my next workout. Um, and, and so it's a little bit of both. It's a yes and no. So we know that our muscles, 
um, are more sensitive to protein post-workout. That being said, if you've had um, a protein meal, maybe two to three hours before your last, before, you know, your post-workout meal, you don't need to rush and get it in. If you had a large protein meal, you know, let's say 40 plus grams, you, you don't need to run out of your way, run and grab a scoop of protein and get it in as soon as possible. That being said, let's say you, you decided to train fasted that morning for whatever reason, you hit a heavy, heavy squat day on an, on an empty stomach. Would I try to get protein as fast as possible? I'd probably put a little bit more urgency on that post-workout protein then. So, um, but ultimately, if your protein intake is pretty consistent throughout the day and overall protein intake is good, then I wouldn't worry too much about it. Just make sure you get it in within a reasonable time window after the fact. And would you say that the only way, like timing is really only critical if you're training fasted or if it's a pre-workout meal because that has to deal with the performance aspect where your blood sugar levels need to be stable. You need to have enough carbohydrates and glycogen before a game or training session. Right, right. Absolutely. So anytime it's a pre-workout meal, you definitely want to emphasize a little bit of importance on that, whether it's the carbohydrates, protein, if you're fasted in the morning, get that protein in right post-workout. And then like, like we kind of said in the previous episode, if it's, if it's multiple training sessions, uh, you also want to be more detailed in making sure that you're getting those carbohydrates and protein for recovery, you know, after the fact, after your training session, before your next training session. Got it. Ale Blitzboy asks, is it good if I start getting in protein shakes or protein powders at 15 years old? So this is, this kind of goes into the creatine we talked about in the last episode where is there a downfall to taking protein powder? Uh, no, there, there isn't just, you know, obviously don't abuse it. Don't base your diet around four shakes a day. Um, but you don't want to be dependent on the protein powder. So if you're going to use it, um, use it once a day, try not to use it more and don't let that protein powder take away from your actual diet. At the end of the day, it is a supplement. It's supposed to help with that last couple percentage points of, you know, of what your overall nutrition should look like. So you can absolutely use it. Just make sure you don't abuse it. Don't overuse it. And most importantly, make sure the rest of your nutrition is, is good and, and is all set. Yeah. And I know we have a lot of young athletes listening and when we see those muscle fitness magazines of those guys being, being super ripped and big and they say it's this protein powder, what people don't see is that like 98% of it is actually the whole foods that they've eaten, all right. chicken breast, the, the broccoli, all that. And that protein powder, like Jake said, is just, just that extra edge. And I think that's especially important for young athletes to understand that get your baseline, get your, your whole food set first, have good eating habits before you even consider supplements. Feliciano Larong asks, I'm a 22 year old girl who weighs 38 kilos or 83 pounds, 156 centimeters. I eat three meals a day. I want to gain weight, but I have a heart disease that, so I can't do much exercise. It's hard for my heart. So what food should I eat to gain weight? So I guess I'm assuming that's not going to tax the heart. Um, so what, what, I guess what's your, what advice do I have for her? So I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to take a, a stab at it. Um, but you know, as, and I'm sure, you know, you've had us say this before, you know, we're not doctors. I'm not a doctor. You know, my master's is in nutrition, but I don't know anything about whatever she's dealing with on, on her end. And most importantly, it would be, I, I would ask your doctor that question first. Mm -hmm. um, and then even potentially hire a nutritionist or dietitian who specializes in, in working with that, with that demographic of whether it's, you know, whatever disease or heart condition is going on and having them work together. So that would be my absolute answer and not to prescribe anything, just to give suggestions. Um, after you talking to the doctor, if he says everything's okay, you know, maybe find a routine that you can work that that's light intensity. If, like I said, if that doctor allows you, um, and then just eat, you know, just like anything else, if you're looking to gain weight, eat in a, eat in a minor surplus, you know, a higher protein a, a amount will be a little bit better for body composition. So if you are allowed to train, that's great. Try to eat a little bit higher protein because that's going to help with overall body composition and then eating in a minor surplus is going to help you gain weight over time. So, so that would be my answer. But ultimately, go ask your doctor, go ask maybe a dietitian who specializes in that and have them work together. Definitely. 
Uh, Lynn Rinnick asks, what is the best ideal approach uh, for nutrition wise, building muscle, leaning out and making sure to get important nutrients? So it looks like what's, what's the, what are the essential nutrients? What, is, what are the essential nutrients and balance of carbs and proteins? So ultimately, I guess she's asking about recomposition, recomposition, yeah, it's like building muscle, leaning out while still getting the and the most important nutrients to do that. Looks like that's sure. the so let's tackle that in, in a bit. So recomposition, as we talked about in the first episode, um, you want to take in more protein than probably you're used to. Um, so if you're looking at per pound of body weight, you might want to go anywhere from, I always say, 0.8 grams per pound to all the way up to 1.4. So if you're a new athlete uh, who hasn't trained much, and who is on the higher percent of body fat, you can get away with recomping at 0.8 grams per pound as protein. Um, if you're well-trained, you're, you're an advanced lifter, and you're fairly lean, you may want to go to that 1.4 range, so 1.4 grams protein per, per pound. Um, and then you also want to decide whether you, you're looking to lose weight ultimately, gain weight, or stay the same. If you're looking to stay the same, find your maintenance calories, um, and then use that same protein approach that I just talked about. If you're looking to lose weight, but still go through a recomp. So I'm talking lose, you know, three pounds of fat or gaining one to two pounds of fat, then you want to be in a slight deficit. And then the same thing for the inverse. So if you're looking to maybe on a drastic end, gain five pounds of muscle and lose one or two pounds of fat, then you want to be in a, in a slight surplus with those same protein recommendations. Um, and then in terms of issues asking about vitamins, minerals, and, and all of that. Yeah. Simple answer. Um, eat everything that's a different color. <laughs> so change up the colors you're eating. <laughs> so, you know, spinach, green, you want to switch up your fruits, you know, blueberries, or blue, apples, different colors. So if you just go through the Roy G. Biv of, um, you know, the rainbow of fruits and veggies, you'll hit every vitamin and mineral fair. So that's like a good guide and a rough estimate to, to how to structure your diet. That's awesome. I'm going to steal that. The Roy G. Biv diet right there. <laughs> copyright. Copyright. <laughs> All right. Last question from YouTube before we go to our Instagram. Uh, with documentaries like Game Changers, uh, do you agree that athletes can benefit from a vegetarian diet and can they get sufficient protein from that? Sure. So Game Changers, um, for those of you who don't know, is a documentary based around athletes going plant-based, if not vegetarian and, and vegan, and they try to steer athletes a little bit away from, from meat. Um, so I, I watched the whole documentary, and without going in depth into everything about it, if you're looking to become vegan or vegetarian, figure out why right why are you doing this and a lot of people will say well i watched this documentary and, and they showed that this is the best approach for athletes well if you think about it 99 percent of professional athletes and, and olympians are, are meat eaters um, so this is just showing you the documentary is showing you that there's a small group of athletes that are benefiting or, or have been benefiting from a plant-based diet and who's to say that that small group of athletes wouldn't have actually done better on a, on a meat based, you know, diet plan and not saying that's the case. They may be performing better. Um, but first is, is figure out why you want to do it and why you want to stray away from the 99% of athletes who are on a meat based uh, diet. Um, and then two, just know you can absolutely meet the protein requirements on a vegan diet, but it requires you to be way more disciplined about making sure you're getting all your vitamins and nutrients in, getting high leucine content food, you know, meats and, and eggs and, and dairy are filled with leucine, which is the, the most important, you know, amino acid for, for building muscle. And vegan diets tend to have lower amounts. So you can absolutely reach that threshold and get more protein. In fact, that's what you guys need. Vegans need more protein. Um, just know that it's a, a more difficult route and it's a more um, strenuous and you have to make sure that, that everything is on point more, almost more so, so that you're not deficient in something else. Because uh, meat has a pretty much a, a greater nutrition profile of what it can provide, right? Than, than having to, to have to eat five or different foods to give you what beef can give you, for example, right? 
Right, right. You know, you see a lot of uh, combining rice and beans together. That's how you can uh, create, you know, a complete protein when, you know, meat is a complete protein by itself, you know. So it's just picking why you want to do it, figuring out if that's the right approach um, and maybe looking at different ways to, to reach that same goal if you're, if you're not satisfied with maybe with the route you were originally planning on taking. Yeah. And one thing I appreciate that you, you noted is it is a principle driven decision because what we know now in an exercise science and nutrition is that there's nothing to say that vegan diets are superior necessarily. Right. Um, but it, it should be a personal choice. You're not going to get a huge advantage or a huge benefit. Um, and a lot of the people I've, I've seen that documentary too, a lot of people that they've cited who had drastic changes in health usually came from diets that were actually very poor already. So if right. they just transitioned to eating healthy whole foods, I, I, I believe they would have gotten similar effects. So the, the vegan diet just happens to really emphasize the whole food consumption part. So right. that's kind of my, my thoughts. Most of, the, most of the time you see, um, if someone decides to be vegan, uh, they, they ultimately live a healthier lifestyle than, yeah. than the standard, of standard American diet, which is what they compare it to. Um, you know, if, if you're vegan, a lot of the times you like to, you know, like you like to exercise, you like to do yoga, you know, you go in the sauna, you go out for runs, you, you have health seeking behaviors. And when compared to the standard American diet, which is high in meat, there's, there's no, I, I'm not guessing why the vegans are way healthier than the standard American. I know they are. It's just what we should be looking at is, you know, the different, the pros and cons, and there's pros and cons with everything between uh, a, vegan, a healthy vegan diet and a healthy meat eating diet. And so if you wanted to get into it, if someone wants to get into a debate there, absolutely go for it. But that's kind of the distinction that needs to be made. And at the end of the day, there's always trade-offs. There's always going to be a pro and there's always going to be a con, whether it's with exercise selection or, or nutrition and, and diet selection. Perfect. Well put. Let's finish off with a couple of Instagram questions. Sorry, my internet all of a sudden got really, oh, great. No internet connection. Sorry, I'm, I'm admiring your, your shoe collection while, while we're at <laughs> so. That's my uh, homemade decoration for amateur YouTube channels. You need to get a, 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 a custom haiku, haiku shoes. <laughs> Do you watch haiku? No, no. I watch, I watch a lot of anime, but that's, that's oh, okay. not the one. Yeah, so I saw, I saw your series. It's a hit. Dude, it's it's blowing up. I just did it for fun, and it's crazy how many people actually started playing volleyball because of that anime. So if you get a chance, I mean, I even for non volleyball people, I heard it's really good. So yeah, I've heard I've heard good things about it. So <laughs> that's cool that you're an anime fan. What, what's your favorite one? Oh, uh, I'm a I'm a big uh, uh, Shippuden. Naruto Shippuden is Black Clover and probably Hunter X Hunter are the top three. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, so uh, Pain Free Volleyball asked, would love to know your thoughts on proper nutrition for volleyball tournaments like USA Nationals, which is a three-day volleyball tournament, and they're usually playing anywhere from three to six volleyball matches per day. Right, and, and these can be, and these can be right, like over three days, correct? A long period of time? Yeah, so it's three to six games per day over three days, consecutive days. Right. So the, the number one important thing is, is going to be planning, right? You need to have a game plan uh, of, what, of what your schedule looks like, first of all. So you need to have when you're playing, what times you're playing, if you know around what times, how many breaks you're going to get in between, you know, each, each volleyball game um, and what time you're going to potentially finish. Now, a lot of these are obviously up in the air, but you need to at least have a blueprint that you can follow or, you know, a rough draft and go from there. So one is, is obviously figuring out how many meals you need to bring with you over prepare, make sure you have everything you need. Uh, and and kind of like we've been saying this whole time, pick foods you're familiar with. Don't, you know, if there's a food truck outside and, and they're selling, you know, meatball parm and you, you know, probably don't go for that. Probably bring, you know, your white rice, your potatoes, your eggs, you know, your, your simple carbohydrates, even, uh, you know, glucose tablets I use on, on meat day. I'll take uh, two, two glucose tablets after every attempt uh, at a powerlifting competition. Mm. And, and so just really being able to time, you know, your, your simple sugars, your, your, 
complex carbs, whether it's early in the morning, simple sugars in between each match, uh, and then potentially even using a little bit of caffeine towards the end of the day. Because for me, I, I don't know how much you guys know about powerlifting. You start off with your squats, then you do your bench, and then you do your deadlift. If you take all of your caffeine and all your pre-workout for your squats, you're, you know, you're going to crash for by the time deadlifts come. So I'll usually time it towards the end of bench or even the start of deadlift. So that, that helps me out towards the end of the day. Um, so being able to time caffeine properly to, to aid you and not hurt you at the, you know, cause a lot of people will abuse it and you need to make sure that you're using it the correct way. Yeah. And one thing I add on that for how I prepare for volleyball tournaments, uh, I, I buy liquid IV, which is like a powdered electrolyte drink. And that's really easy to transport, especially if you have to fly to a tournament. So the USA Nationals is a, and usually in another state. So instead of bringing, you know, trying to buy a bunch of Gatorade, I'll pack that and just put that in water. And then, like you said, the caffeine, before the second to last match or the last match, I'll try to, I always mix black coffee. You know, every hotel is going to have really easy powdered black coffee. I'll put that in a thermos and I'll, I'll down that before the second last game to give me that extra boost and focus uh, when I start to feel tired. Yeah, absolutely. So you don't even need me. You can answer these questions for sure. <laughs> um. No, you add, you add the tidbits and you talk about the science, but then you also package it in a way where it like, is digestible. So I'm just talking from experience. I appreciate it. All right. This is a, a height question. I'm sure a lot of young kids – wonder what type of food and nutrients nutrients do you recommend to achieve my maximum height when i'm a full adult so they're looking for what foods to become the maximum height while they're still adolescents yeah yeah so i mean this is a lot of this is going to be genetics but there is you know a little bit and i don't even want to say research or, or, or scientific data out there um, but we know that there's a range at which you can grow to. Um, so, but the range isn't that large. So for example, I'm, I'm five foot four. I'm definitely not the tallest athlete out there. Um, but who's to say my, my genetic range wasn't between five, three and five, five. And I ended up in the middle. My parents like to make fun of me saying that I would have been taller if I didn't starve myself during wrestling season. <laughs> um, so that's kind of some of the research, which is you definitely need to eat to grow. Right. So if you're constantly starving yourself, constantly under eating, and I'm no doctor, this is just me theorizing based on what I know is if you're not giving your body the, the nutrients um, and the calories that it needs to grow, it's not going to grow the way it wants to. Mm. Um, but if you're making sure that you're eating at least at a maintenance or even a caloric surplus or with a well-rounded diet, um, there should be no reason why you don't reach what you're supposed to be, or even potentially slightly taller. But again, no doctor, but I would imagine if you're under eating, your body's not going to want to grow. It doesn't want to grow anything else when it's under eating. It's not going to want you to get taller if you're under eating. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great suggestion, especially for a lot of, I remember when I was in high school, I would binge like three, three packages of top ramen and I just wouldn't eat for 10 hours. Cause I'd be playing video games or hanging out <laughs> with my friends. Right. And Absolutely. Then, bag of hot Cheetos and then I'm, I'm done for the day. <laughs> well, my, my high school was next to, we had a choice. We had a choice between McDonald's, nice. um, Taco Bell and Wendy's. Those were the three closest to us. So those, those were our choices. So as you can either eat the school's great food, right? Um, or being sarcastic, definitely not great food. <laughs> you can walk to McDonald's, Wendy's or Taco Bell. So definitely not the greatest choices all the time. And then again, you go home and you play video games with your friends till midnight so yeah no all right down to our last question okay we since we we'll, might have some uh vegetarians we'll finish off on this one uh, vegan nutrition for a high school volleyball so however you want to interpret that sure um so we kind of touched a little bit on you know the pros and cons of, of being vegan especially being younger um so one thing is obviously you need to make sure you, you have a well-rounded diet. So vitamin B supplementation is going to be huge. We know that vegans tend to have lower levels of, of vitamin B in their diet. So making sure to supplement with that, um, then you're going to also need higher levels of, of protein. So adding, you know, if you are planning on having one gram per pound, I would, I would bump it up to maybe, um, 1.1 or 1.2 even if you're focusing on your diet so adding extra protein throughout the day so you're going to need more protein than maybe your, your meat eating counterpart 
and, and then like we said in, in the previous you know, previous episode, which might be hard for a kid to get done, but I think is, is it important, especially if they're, you know, potentially a high level athlete is, is having your parents, you know, check on your blood work and making sure everything is looking okay. Cause if you get your blood work taken and you're deficient in everything, you either need to make a change on your diet or you need to start figuring out what's going on with you. So just making sure that you know, you're vegan and that's okay. And just having to, you know, you just got to make sure you're crossing your T's and dotting your I's when it comes to, to your diet and what your goals are at the end of the day. Awesome. Man, that was so fun. Um, I wish we could go longer, but, you know, we, we got lives to live and work to do. But I would love to connect again in the future. If you guys enjoyed this conversation and want to learn more about nutrition for sports performance, uh, Jake actually wrote a fantastic ebook that I've read. And like I said earlier, he does a very good job of compacting complex scientific concepts into small digestible bits that everyday people like you and me can understand and apply to our lives. So essentially, he's done all the hard work so we can just chill and, and, <laughs> and yeah. just do what the book says. But he's offering 50% off um, his ebook to all the listeners. So make sure you guys take advantage of that. Um, that discount is already built into the link in the description box. And is there anything else you wanted to share with our fans? Uh, maybe how they can get access to your consulting services or just learn and connect with you a little bit more? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, you know, obviously, if you guys are interested in just reading a bit more, you can check out, you know, Performance Nutrition, which is like, like you said, the, the link is in the bio and it's 85 pages on everything you need to know about eating for athletes. Uh, if you want to connect with me, ask me a couple of questions, be my guest, check out my Instagram, jgottraining, J-G-O-T-T underscore training. Um, feel free to ask me whatever questions you guys have. If you want to work with me, shoot me a DM on there or check out um, my website, overtimeathletes.com. It's a company I work for um, and you can apply there to, to work with me and you can send me an application and, and we'll talk and see if it's a good fit for you guys. Cool. And speaking of supplementation and nutrition, uh, one thing I want to shout out to is Upper Echelon Nutrition, which is a protein supplement that I've been using for the last couple of months, and I felt a big difference. Um, it's hard to find protein supplements that aren't super sweet, so it's a very mild sweetness, uh, low in calorie. It's only 100 calories for 20 grams of protein and a high ratio of whey isolate protein. So make sure you guys take advantage of my 10% discount code in the description box to get your upper echelon nutrition for the protein supplement that I use for myself as well as my clients. Well, thanks again, Jake, for being on the show. Uh, hopefully we can connect in the future. Um, I, I was a wannabe power lifter back in the day when I, when I hit my thousand total, I was done. Uh, I was, that was one of my life goals, but uh, I would love to talk, continue to talk more about, you know, sports performance and nutrition in the future. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And uh, if you ever want to talk powerlifting nutrition, let me know. And maybe you can help me, uh, you know, overcome my uh, height and get a little bit better. <laughs> hey, you know, lots of, uh, lots of triple extension in both, both sports. Uh, yep. Absolutely. Cool.